We are back and we are joined now by Kyle Bailey from Helsinki. Well, he's he's in Helsinki now, a PhD candidate at the depart in the Department of Politics at York University in Toronto. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much for for coming on today. Uh, it's fantastic to be here, Emma. So I gotta say, you know, I am I am Finnish. Um, I have family still in Finland in uh, in kind of like the southwest area, uh, you know, Pori and. Uh, I'm not sure if you know uh, Sikainen, but like I went there and visited there when I was 13. But there were a few other cities where my family is, but I don't remember. Um, anyway, it's 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 beautiful, and I would love to go back at some point because I still have like cousins and, and stuff in Finland. But um, yeah, it, not a not a great time right now for Finland in terms of <laughs> the election results. Um, man, like f for our audience, so. Last, I would imagine a lot of people heard about leadership in Finland was Prime Minister Sanna Marin and her, um, you know, videos of her dancing with her friends, which was so outrageous. But her center left party has lost um, and came in third in April in the elections. And that's given rise to a right wing government in Finland. Um, how did that happen? How did she get ousted despite like the left within the context of fin Finnish politics being incredibly strong historically? Well, I mean, I mean, there, there's kind of like a, a, a wider backdrop to this, you know, it seems almost banal to say it at this point, but what we've been living through for the past decade or more is, is basically a multi-dimensional crisis of neoliberal global capitalism. So, so in the years from the 2008 global financial crisis until the global uh, COVID pandemic, we've seen all kinds of morbid symptoms of this crisis. We've seen growing economic inequality and social uh, exclusion. And you know, that's been exacerbated by a decade of austerity uh, including to some extent in the Nordic countries. We've seen the rise of uh, populist leaders who are openly disdainful of globalization and the growing centrality uh, of the climate uh, emergency. And you know, one, one of the biggest trends in, in this crisis has been the, the waning of the so-called neoliberal center the, the centrist political parties in Europe and elsewhere. So whereas uh, at the core of this kind of neoliberal project during the 1990s and 2000s, which was really epitomized by uh, um, Clintonism in the United States and third way social democracy in Britain and Europe, uh, at the core of this was really trying to lock in and kind of constitutionalize neoliberal reforms in all these different countries. But since uh, 2008, uh, that, that kind of politics has been waning a lot, uh, so much so uh, actually that now the, these uh, centrist parties are finding it harder and harder to square the requirements of capital accumulation globally with the interests of the populations whose votes uh, they need uh, to stay in power. And, you know, unfortunately, the, the fledgling uh, kind of socialist left that we've seen grow up hasn't been the main political beneficiary of this waning uh, neoliberal center. Mm. It's, it's been the far right, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing today. That's like the wider context for things, things in Finland as well. You have this kind of dialectical double act. Uh, like a, a double act between this uh, declining neoliberal center and a rising far right. And we're seeing in, in all the different countries of Europe and further afield, all, all the different possible combinations that that kind of double act uh, can take. So the election results, right? The National Coalition Party came in first, then the Finns Party, which is the far right, very scary party, and we'll talk talk about them in a second. And then Ma uh, Marin Social Democratic Party finished in third. Now, just take us through that election in April, how that shook out, and then eventually the coalition formed by those top two parties, the center-right party and then the far-right party. Well, I mean, there, there was uh, 
coalition talks that seemed at sometimes quite fraught, but you you saw a meeting of minds. And and really, what we've ended up with uh, with this government is is ba it's basically a coalition of uh, a neoliberal. Uh, centrist party, the National Coalition Party, uh, and and the far right. So basically, a go a coalition of far right racists and their neo liberal enablers. So I mean, in in the government coalition talks, the the true Finns, which are a far right uh, party, they they spent most of their time trying to get uh, anti immigration reforms in included in the government program. So these are things like higher income caps uh, for co foreign workers, uh, stricter guidelines in order to acquire Finnish uh, citizenship. And they, they wanted to like reduce drastically the number of refugees uh, Finland takes. And you know, uh, several Finns ministers have made absolutely no secret of their overt hostility uh, towards immigrants. Like you said, this is a quite scary uh, party in many ways. So they're overtly hostile to especially black and brown immigrants. Uh, they, they've got far right affiliations and, and also pro-fascist and, and pro-Nazi sympathies. So to give you uh, a, a couple of examples, uh, the Minister of Economic Economic Affairs, uh, Wilhelm Unila, he narrowly just recently survived a, a vote of no confidence, and but then he was forced to resign soon after, after it was revealed, among other things, that he'd been uh, a speaker at a rally organized uh, by basically violent Nazi uh, thugs, like a veritable who's who of neo-Nazis in Finland, like including the now banned uh, Nordic resistance movement. So, I mean, that, that's just one and example. And he said There's he others. made multiple jokes about Heil Hitler. Like, I mean, multiple jokes about that. I mean, and he was also, I think... Uh, what I read was that he made a com comments as well about promoting, quote, climate abortion in Africa, meaning saying that we should give abortions to Africans to combat climate change. So we've talked about ecofascism within the context of it, like kind of catching up in the United States. Some of the rhetoric, it's it's just much more robust right now in Europe. But I'm, we're going to see an importation of it, I'd imagine, like really scary stuff uh, uh, for one of the top. Uh, ministries uh, in Finland to have be, be led by that guy at least you know before he was forced to resign. Oh yeah, certainly. And you know everything's always a joke uh, with the Finns party, and of course it's not a joke. Let, let's uh, go through a couple of other uh, Finns ministers. So you see uh, Hala Aho, uh, the former Finns party leader, and now the Speaker of the Parliament. This guy is a militant, an unapologetic racist. This is someone who thinks that Islam is a religion of pedophiles. Uh, this is someone who said uh, that Somalis have a genetic trait uh, to rob and steal from people. This is someone who's even said things like that he thinks, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if pro-immigration uh, female MPs were raped uh, by foreigners? So I mean, I mean, you know, this is the kind of and stuff. And he's the and, he's the speaker of parliament now, right? Because and he's a part of this Finns party, right? This is the party that came in second for people still following the far right party and a part of this coalition. Yes, he's the former leader, and he he's uh, an ideologically influ influential person in this parliament, uh, in this uh, party, and he's now the speaker of the parliament, yes. And and the current Finns party leader, uh, Rika Pura, is, is now the finance minister. And she's also, uh, in the past, made a whole host of uh, racist and even violent uh, comments uh, against immigrants, including on Halo Aho's blog. So, I mean, th this is one, at least one half of the story uh, with this, uh, with this uh, government, you know, uh, far right racism. <laughs> so this, yeah, they now hold how many uh, ministry seats, the Finns party? Well, they're, they're the junior 
partner in in the coalition and and this brings me uh to the 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 other side of the story not just far right racists but their their neoliberal uh, enablers so so the party which formed the coalition is Petri Orpo's uh, national coalition party and th this is a party that's championing uh ch committed to an extreme uh neoliberal austerity uh, program. So this includes, uh, for example, what's in the government program uh, right now includes like 6 billion uh, euros worth of cuts over the next parliament to health, education and welfare, including cuts to uh, unemployment benefit, uh, to housing benefit and to social assistance. And I, I mean, that that's one side of it, cuts. But the, the, this uh, government program also includes a number of direct attacks on, on the Finnish labor movement. So, for example, the, these range from a, a very unpopular measure to make the, the first day of sick leave uh, that workers take unpaid uh, to things like uh, restrictions and fines for workers who engage in sympathy strikes and who engage in uh, wildcat strikes things like this. It's a very extreme uh, program in many ways. And, and so it's just the uh, worst marriage uh, possible. You have Nazis and uh, anti-worker pro-austerity uh, measures working together um, as a part of the, the this new government. And, and I guess that does bring me to the party that came in third, the Social Democrats. Um, what is your uh, take on where they drop the ball here in advocating for the, their party to continue to hold power? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you you can kind of see when when we're looking even now at reactions uh, to this kind of new government, which has, uh, on the one hand, dragged the Finns party away from its more kind of welfare nationalist economic policies towards uh, an austerity program that can be expected to hurt their own voters in the end, and, and the National Coalition Party in turn being dragged uh, towards some far right uh, social policies. I mean, if we look at the broad reactions to this, uh, like on the broad left, we, we, we can see both some like prospects and, and pitfalls going forward. So to address your question, I mean, a lot of the, the like liberal and center left um, responses to the government, uh, they, they've focused a lot on like the damage uh, that racist ministers uh, are doing to Finland's international reputation and kind of like progressive uh, veneer. But, you know, in, in, in some ways they don't go very uh, deep. Like on, on, on the one hand, they don't necessarily uh, even address, uh, you know, the government program and like especially the austerity parts. Uh, in, in in addition to the to the racism so i mean i mean that's one thing uh the the social democrats have tended uh for the for the last decades to have kind of in their own way embraced uh neoliberal economic reforms as well and we, we've had governments in finland that also include center right parties uh, as well that have kind of been part of this uh neoliberal consensus in finland which, which has been more like moderate than in some other places like Britain or, or the United States, but has nevertheless been uh, very real. Uh, so I mean that that that's one thing. But then then there's also uh, some questions uh, ab ab about like the the even the the further left uh, groupings. And I I I don't know what kind of questions you you want to ask, but maybe maybe we could also consider some of the 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 actual left wing responses as well sure i i go ahead if you don't mind expanding uh yeah so for for example there, there's a, like at least some good prospects for like challenging this government like we we've seen some quite uh, good early small scale protests outside of the the finnish parliament which is promising in in terms of building a wider movement to challenge this especially if the left can kind of join up the the different fragments of all the groups that are interested in uh, protesting this new government, which is quite broadly unpopular. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, that's one thing. Another thing is that the, the assaults on the labor movement also open up the possibility uh, that the trade unions will take action. And for example, it's not impossible to imagine at least a one day general strike uh, in the future. And it, it, it has some precedent in, in, in Finland. So, I mean, that's, that's something. But I, I mean, th there are also a lot of issues that even on, on, on the left, we, we sometimes struggle with uh, as well. So like, for example, when we're talking about the, the causes of far right racism and you know, what's actually driving it, uh, sometimes we talk about austerity on the left, but we, we don't necessarily go, go deeper to talk about the, the forces of capitalism and globalization. The, that are also driving uh, the working class into misery and also now driving a, a significant portion of the middle class uh, into misery as well and creating a base uh, all around Europe and in North America and elsewhere for these kind of far right uh, racist parties. So, I mean, like, let, let's take one example. Uh, like the, the European left in, in general has has historically and now, and especially since Brexit, uh, it's, it's had more and more trouble separating kind of the wheat from the chaff when it comes to thinking about the European Union. So for example, uh, most people on, on the European left tend to point to things in the EU like its defense of international human rights standards and things like the, the free um, movement of labor but if we really look at the EU, that's not really the core uh, of the project. Like the core institutions are the European single market and the common currency, the Eurozone. And, and what these have kind of represented in, in relation to all these neoliberal governments uh, we've had in Europe uh, is, is a thoroughly like anti-democratic project of locking in uh, neoliberal reforms in, in the interests of capital and big business. So, I mean, uh, one, one thing going forward uh, that the left really needs to do in order to get at these deep structural causes is, is separate out the, the aspects of the European Union that support capital, free trade and, and globalization and those, uh, and those which uh, support workers. Because, you know, the free movement of workers in the EU, which was so important uh, in the Brexit referendum. I mean, surely that's an end in itself and something that's important in itself and not just as a complement to the free movement of capital. So what we need to do on the left is, is, is oppose the international mobility of capital while supporting uh, the mobility of labor and the institutionalization of workers' rights and, and power. So, I mean, that, that's a kind of fawny uh, issue for no, the left as points. well going forward. Uh, great points. I, I would imagine, though, that um, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic because Finland is such a small nation that um, the resistance to those kinds of forces uh once these like neoliberal interests get a foot in the door must be quite difficult given like the uh the power of the capital on the other side and i guess that brings me to just my next question about the threat that this new coalition um with the uh, that is much more sympathetic to those forces um what is the threat to the lauded and uh honestly robust by particularly american standards uh modes of social safety within finland in terms of like you know having one of the best education systems in the world um having uh, the uh, having labor laws that are so much more tilted towards workers that they have engaged in something like a general strike <laughs> before which is something so foreign to us in the american context like if you could just give us a sense of some of the social programs how successful they've been in finland and how they might be under threat with this new government? Uh, well, I mean, F Finland over the course of the 20th century, uh, following in, in some ways uh, the example of Sweden, but also setting in, in others its own, 
uh, course, uh, built up a, a comprehensive and, and quite uh, surprisingly, even by European standards, universalist uh, welfare state that was really based on a, a kind of the, the idea was a, a class compromise between uh, capitalists and workers, but also rooted and, and backed up by significant power uh, on the part of, of labor. But I mean, especially since the, from the 1970s and 80s and through to the, the recession uh, in the 1990s in Finland, these things have been slowly uh, eroded and chipped away at. And so for example, Finland's had one of the, the fastest rising rates of inequality in Europe uh, and it's the fastest rising because uh, it started it starts from a relatively low level right but the the direction of travel uh, is still quite clear because you know after the the crisis of the 1970s that capitalist crisis uh, employers everywhere they 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 walked out on this idea uh, of, of a comprehensive welfare state that would balance between the interests of capitalists and workers. And I, I mean, since then, we've seen uh, especially like uh, social democratic parties in, in Finland and elsewhere, but also center-right, kind of slowly chipping away at these gains from uh, gains of workers. Because, you, you know, really, that's what neoliberalism is anyway. It's like capitalism without significant uh, resistance from workers. And, and you, you know, the, these latest, this latest round of, of quite extreme austerity in, in the government program is going to hit uh, quite hard, potentially, if they manage to get all the legislation through, because the, the, the parliament's uh, uh, just about to open. So, but you know, it can be quite extreme and the cuts to unemployment benefit and, uh, and social assistance, which is like a last uh, resort uh, benefit for, for people who, who really need income uh, to get by. Like cuts to these kind of things are gonna really hurt, including people who voted for the Finns party. And I mean, it's one of these great ironies that these far right, uh, quote unquote, populist uh, parties claim to represent the interests of an excluded working class. Uh, I mean, just like Trump did as, as well in the yeah. United States. But then they, they actually end up uh, screwing them over. And, <laughs> and, you know, they're not really offering any kind of real challenge uh, to the power of uh, employers and the establishment like they claim. How does uh, what's happening in Finland, and uh, I'm not sure if you can speak on this, it's fine if not, um, connect to the, f the, the right word shift in Sweden as well? Um, there's a border that's shared, obviously, something like 5%, if I'm not mistaken, of, of Finns are Swedish speakers um, natively. Uh, it, I might be off on that, that, that percentage, you can correct me, Kyle, but... Um, like, what is the connection there? Are are those movements in any way analogous? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know exactly about the networks which link, say, the far right in Sweden and Finland. I mean, what, what I maybe could tentatively say is that uh, uh, Sweden has uh, historically, as part of its immigration policy, taken in more uh, migrants uh, than Finland, for example, it has a, a large uh, Kurdish uh, community mm. in Sweden. For example, that was a factor in the negotiations around Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Because, yeah. yeah, Erdogan, uh, Turkey's uh, authoritarian uh, leader, uh, actually had a real problem with uh, Sweden taking uh, Kurdish uh, migrants who, who had been standing up against Turkey's historic uh, oppression of, of Kurds in, in the Middle East. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly. Emma. Sure. I, that was uh, completely out of left field. So don't don't even worry about it. But um, that, that, I guess, is where I'd love to, to take our conversation before we wrap um, about Finland's um, entry into NATO and how that connects really with um, the politics of, of the far right rising and, and if there is a connection, 
how bipartisan the desire is within Finland to join NATO and what that means, I guess, about neoliberalism and austerity within Finland. Well, I mean, I mean, ju- just taking like NATO, I, I mean, it's uh, it's part of a whole uh, complex of institutions that have actually come to play a, a large role in 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 neoliberalism uh, writ large. Because it, it's not just about economics, like uh, you know, uh, weaponry and wars uh, also back up uh, capitalist. Uh, interests and and nato's played quite a, a a vicious role in supporting american power especially and american wars in in iraq and in afghanistan and in other places like this uh what where it gets complicated is that uh finland uh obviously has a very very long border and a very long history with russia so when putin invaded ukraine uh, people in Finland, they, they identified very directly with Ukrainian suffering. And th- there were all these kind of analogies to like Finland's uh, uh, conflicts with Russia in the Second World War, especially the, the so-called Winter War, mm. you know. So, I mean, I think what we've seen, at, le- at least from my perspective, is that we've seen that pro-Ukrainian sentiment really channeled uh, somewhere where it needn't have gone actually, which is into pro-NATO sentiment. Like the problem is really seen uh, not as one of militarism and violence more generally and of military alliances uh, making the world uh, a less safe place. The problem is seen as one of Russian imperialism and NATO is the answer to make Finland uh, more safe. And, that, and that's been the majority perspective in Finland, uh, and basically amongst all the the main political parties. And uh, you can according- understand it, though, right? I mean, I guess it is an easy sell in terms of just like the history of past Russian in- invasions of Finland. It, it like domestically, I would imagine that that that's pr- that's not going to meet much resistance. Yeah, and and you know, Ukraine needed to wage a war of self-defense against Russia, uh, who who invaded it. So that had to be done. But where it gets complicated, of course, is that you're you're kind of inviting in American power and American imperialism to try and and balance uh, against Russia. And here's where it gets uh, complicated, because the, the American interest, even though they keep saying it's to help Ukraine win a quick war against Russia. I mean, it, it, it's not it, it's not quite like that. I, I mean, sometimes I call it kind of like a, a, a Goldilocks war in, in some ways. And what I mean by that is that the, the Americans, they, they want to intervene uh, to prop up Ukraine just enough so that the Ukrainians don't sign uh, what what they the Americans would regard, especially as a capitulationist settlement along the lines of Minsk uh, or Minsk uh, two, right? So they they want to prop them up enough to avoid that, but not so much as, as to inadvertently end up dragging the United States, especially because when we're we're talking about NATO. We're really talking about the Americans because they they account for seventy percent of all dis- defense spending, uh, you know, war spending across all NATO members. So I mean, th- th- the Americans don't want to prop up Ukraine so much that they would get dragged into a direct war with Russia, either. Right. Well, I mean that that is the the uh, I would say the balance being struck here. Um, I, it, it, we, we had an interview on Monday about this as well, um, which was met, like, I think f- with some mixed reactions from people, um, about the, about NATO in general and about the United States' uh, involvement in Ukraine. I support, fun- I support, uh, funding, uh, the Ukrainian defense, but it, you can still have two, uh, tracks, uh, of, of thought at the same time, which is that NATO, though, is... It clearly, clearly an extension of 
U.S. interests within Europe, and then for Sweden and Finland to join into the alliance within, what, like a year and a half of the invasion, um, that, that is clearly, I would say, a win for U.S. Uh, <laughs> capitalist interests and uh, international kind of empire interests within the context of Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And unfortunately, it's always the same with militarism on wars. I mean, you have hawks on, you know, our side, and then you have hawks uh, on the other sides, in this case, on the Russian side. And, and you know, it's, it's another one of these double acts, because they, they feed off and encourage one another. And I mean, what's, what gets lost and crowded out in all this is, is the possibility of ceasefires, negotiations, uh, and e even a fragile peace. Because while it's true that Ukraine needed to defend itself against Russia, uh, at least enough to be able to negotiate from a position of strength. I mean, what it doesn't need is, is to wage an ongoing war against Russia that's going to be frozen and, and potentially last for years. And, and I mean, if nothing's done, uh, potentially even like a, a lost decade or something like this. And this is something that uh, NATO does uh, impose a constraint uh, in, in terms of because they're, they're uh, not really interested in negotiations. What, what they're interested in is one, weakening Russia, which is something completely different from helping Ukraine, potentially at least. Uh, they want uh, to overcome contradictions within NATO, especially uh, that France and Germany would play a more independent uh, role vis-a-vis -vis the United States in NATO. And, and you know, I think in some ways they're, they're also looking towards uh, the bigger picture, uh, not just in Europe, but also in the Pacific, because America's looking at China and it's very yeah. interested in containing China and, you know, in some ways bogging down Russia in, in a long, long war uh, with Ukraine, kind of, uh, you you can kind of see how that kind of contributes to making space for America to continue this uh, strained but nevertheless real pivot to Asia, which started uh, under Obama. Yeah, I mean, well, I, that that uh, that is a consequence. Um, but but fascinating stuff, Kyle Bailey, and also dark stuff particularly about domestically what's happening in Finland. I really yeah. appreciate you catching our audience up with that. Um, PhD candidate at, in the Department of Politics at York University in Toronto. Kyle, where can uh, people find your stuff if, they, if they'd like to read more of what you have to say? Well, I, I have a recent article in, in, the, uh, in this year's Socialist Register, uh, which is published by Merlin Press uh, in London, by Monthly Review in New York, and by Fernwood Press in, in Toronto, so uh, in the Socialist Register 2023. All right. Well, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Kyle. All right. Thank you, Emma. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye.